and welcome to today's data bite, where we're going to talk about interpreting patterns in context. So we're going to explore different kinds of interpretation and what that might mean as we're progressing with our data skills, talk about connections of this interpreting pattern in context and how that relates to our CER or developing our claims from our data, and then a few other things to consider as we're moving forward with this with our students. So obviously when we're thinking about data literacy, this interpret pattern in context fully falls into the interpret part of making sense of data. So before we begin and launch into all of this, I encourage you to pause the video and think about this graphic. What does this mean to you? And what they this mean to your learners? So go ahead, pause, take, take this graphic in, think about that, and then when you're ready, come on back. So the interpret patterns in context is part of our interpret data to learn something in terms of the three different functions, the realms that we work with when we're working with data. And we've broken that down even more to be like, okay, but what does that actually mean? What are the different components of interpreting data to learn something? And this you can find, this is work by my colleague Molly Schaffler and I, you can find it here at this tiny URL where we break down sort of the three main components where we're interpreting patterns and context, justifying an interpretation, and inferring broader meaning. So if we dive into that first one, the sort of interpreting data in context, what might that look like as we're progressing through, as we're building our data skills. So we're gonna use a data set that is made available by Tuva. It is a data set of park visits or visits to national parks all throughout the United States over multiple decades. And we are gonna use this same data set to look at how do we interpret patterns and context from grades kindergarten through 12th grade. Okay, come with me, it's gonna, it's gonna be a wild ride. We're not using the whole data set, I just wanna share. Um, I picked out two historic monuments and uh, from the National Park Service, the Statue of Liberty and the White House. I picked out two national parks, Great Smoky Mountains and the Grand Canyon, and two national seashores, Point Reyes and Assateague Island. So just as some context, we're only actually looking at six parks within the whole National Park Service. So let's dive in. So first and foremost, when we are interpreting something, there has to be a question behind it. So what might be a question that our students would ask of our littles would ask of these data? So maybe the question is, which type of national area or national park is visited the most? And we provide them with one of these frequency bar charts where we've got a sense of the purple is the historic or the monument, the pink are the national parks, and the green are the national seashores. We're gonna use that coloring throughout. So we can look at this and then our students in kindergarten and 12, in kindergarten through second grade, our littles are looking, they're thinking, okay, what type is visited the most? So they're using their skills to understand that the pattern is which is tallest, which is smallest. And then this interpretation piece is, okay, so what does that mean? If pink is the tallest and pink are our parks, okay, so the interpretation is that more people visit parks than shores or historic monuments. We take that up a notch. We can use the same graph. We can ask a similar question, but slightly more advanced for our students in grades three to five or when they're getting to that next level. So how are national parks visited might be our question. So as opposed to which is visited the most, now we're creating a broader question of how are the parks visited? Still looking at the same data, but we're coming at it from a slightly different angle. So now the pattern is, again, that more people come to the parks, but we can put some numbers behind it. So it's not just a visual comparison when looking at that pattern, but we're starting to integrate in our numeracy and our math concepts in as we're making sense of it. And then when it comes to the interpretation, we have a slightly different approach to it, right? Because it's how are the parks visited? Well, different types of parks are, diff are visited more than others. Based on these data, more people visit parks than the seashores. So we're building up and we're sort of being able to make these informal conjectures based off of these data. Okay, so let's 
take the next step. Let's go up to grade six or sort of that next level of working with data. So now our question might be, how do the number of visits a year differ by park type? So we're slightly adjusting which aspect of the data set we're using for this graph. We've got a dot plot of the three graph, the three types of parks. So same as the past, well, the coloring is still very similar. But now, oh, excuse me, now we're looking at all of the data together rather than just the totals as we were looking at in that sort of that frequency bar charts that we were looking at now we're looking at the individual from each year how many visitors came to these different parks and we are in sixth grade we're starting to look because we're starting to look at the aggregate all of our data so the pattern that we would see is based on sort of how many visitors there are for the different types of parks and looking at sort of where is there clumping and kind of what is the the full range of of visitors per year to the different parks so our interpretation builds off of those features the clumping the the sort of the spread of the data that we have to get a sense of what is typical right how can we use that information about the distribution so our interpretation interpretation in this context might be that the historic monu historic monuments typically have the fewest visitors right they're they're hanging out over here uh, along our x axis um, they have fewer than shores but they're sort of similar they're kind of clumped together and that our parks have the highest number of visitors um, each year but that there are some parks that are visited in similar numbers right so now we're getting a sense of looking at all of our data overall Kind of where are there where are things falling out what do these features tell us when we're looking at the group overall and we build on that into seventh and eighth grade again by integrating some of our numeracy and our math concepts of what is the median what is the mode what is sort of how can we numerically get a sense of what is typical so our our question can still be the same of sort of how do the number of parks a number of visits a year differ by park type, but again, what we're expecting from the interpretation is different for our learners because they're advancing forward and how they can interpret and make sense of the graph. Be it the kind of graph that they're making right now, we're looking at a box plot with all of those dots as opposed to just a frequency dot plot. And our interpretation might be that historic monuments and shores typically have fewer visitors and parks based on sort of where the clumps are, where the 50% is, how we are interacting with this box plot and what it is telling us about the data. And then this is the next key piece, right? It's not only that integrating that uh, those sort of statistical foundational concepts of statistical thinking, those summary statistics, but also then being able to think about in our interpretation Therefore, what would I predict forward? So I would predict, knowing we're only looking at six parks in the system, that this would hold true because parks are heard of more or whatever the students wanna pull from, right? But they're taking the information, they're interpreting the pattern as it relates to the context in terms of how many visitors, as in like, what is our question? And then being able to take that next step going forward of, and therefore I would predict X, Y, Z for the broader data set or for the broader phenomenon, things like that. So it's integrating, stitching these different pieces together and building upon that, which we continue to do as we work up into early high school. Again, our graph type can change. The kind of question that we're asking changes, still the same, still the same data set. There's a lot you can do with one data set. So now the question is, how have the number of annual visits by park type changed over time? So rather than just looking at it only by park type, we've now added in where we've separated it out. So now we know what each of those dots go to in terms of their times of the year, right? So again, you got to look at the pattern first. What is the pattern? So we can jump in and we can say, okay, the seashores seem to be pretty consistent, like not changing, pretty similar, staying the same across this time series. Our parks seem to be sort of increasing over our time. One of our historic monuments seems to be increasing. The other might either sort of be staying the same or slightly decreasing. So there's some variation there. It is variable how these different types are reacting. And then the key is to sort of, so that's describing the pattern of what we are actually seeing on the page as it relates to the dots. 
Now the interpretation is, so what does that mean? Okay, so visits over time have varied by park type. We do not have one clear pattern, right? They are not all increasing or decreasing or staying the same. Even across these six different parks that we have, we have variation in how are they reacting, right? The real world, like, there's always variation in there. Well, so giving our students that opportunity to be like, you need to talk about that. And then you also need to think about what might be driving that. Why might they be seeing that? We start to integrate that in into our interpretation, right? We thought about what, you know, sort of predicting forward, if it would hold true. Now it's sort of what are the drivers behind that? And that feeds into our interpretation. So maybe these differences of the increasing in the parks could be driven by you know, people have heard about them more or people are living closer to parks or maybe the decrease is that you know the economy is not as good and that you can't get to the parks or maybe these up and down cycles of where there's sort of you know year to year you know, variation it's not a clear increase or a clear decrease could be driven by vacation habits or the economy things like that so pulling in different pieces of information that are not actually on the page that is what helps with our interpretation as we are building through and then we go even farther right we can model the data we can think about is this a linear relationship is it a nonlinear relationship you can do this before grades 10 to 12 it's just in this context this is where i brought it in so the question here could be what if any is the relationship between annual park visits recreational vehicle overnights the year and the park type oh man we've got four variables going on in that question all at once. And now we are looking to provide a numerical, you know, looking for the sort of the quantitative modeling component of our data. So we're looking at the patterns, we are figuring out how does, uh, how does that model fit the data? Does that make sense? Does that even make sense sort of inside of our brains, how we are thinking about the data and how what it means to us? And then, bringing that into our interpretation of not just this is what the Google Sheets spit out as the equation, but so what does that mean? So if our R squared value for the seashores is around is 0 0.7065, then about 70% of the variation in terms of the annual totals and how that varies across our seashores relates to recreational vehicle use. So indicating that shore parks with lots of vehicle use don't actually have many visitors. And that that's a fairly large amount of that variation that can be explained by that. Okay, you know, that's interesting. That sort of gives us some in, interesting insight to like, oh, there's some there's an interesting pattern going on between these variables. When we look at parks, it's only about 44% of the variation, which could indicate maybe there's a different factor. Maybe there's a different variable that it would explain this better as to why some parks seem to have like lots of lots of visitors and just sort of a middle amount of overnight vehicles or lots of vehicles, but not as many visitors, right? And so that leads to the like, we got to ask more questions. We don't really yet have a good sense of like, what is the relationship for each of the different park types? So hopefully that provided a good sense of like how we interpret varies as we move forward, what we are asking the students to do. Um, but the biggest thing is that it is based in a question. We need to understand what the pattern is. So physically describing what's going on in the data, but interpretation takes that to the next level, right? It takes it to the, so what does this mean? Or what can I gather from this? What other information can I pull in? What can I say from what is on the page to something that is off the page? And that was sort of, I think, where it ties into a lot of times when we're asking our students to develop, to develop their claims, evidence, reasoning, to develop their conclusion from the data, this interpretation piece comes in. Oftentimes, when we're thinking about developing our CER, if you don't use CER, think of fill in CER for conclusion or claim, whatever word that you use, we think about it as we have our data, we have the visual of our data, and we are going to look at that and we are going to develop our claim, and then we will relate it back to our content as you know as to what we are going to take away from this when really when we're working with data, it is this stitching together of the content, the for what the visuals, the how we're actually looking at, 
and the data, the with what, that helps us bring it together. And that this interpretation piece, which connects the data we have and the content that we are looking at it, and what does it mean? Like, what does it mean off the page? What can I predict from this? What does this tell me about the broader phenomenon? Is just one of three main components that feeds in to making sense of stitching these three pieces together the content the content the visuals and the data together the interpretation piece if you want to sort of think about this more dive into this more what does this mean well, with data i highly encourage you to come join us in the seventh session of the data literacy series where we unpack this even more and we talk through examples of how do we scaffold our learners through these three different stages to help stitch this together to set them up for more success when developing a claim from their data so just a few final notes to consider because i want to wrap this up so we keep it quick there is prior knowledge that is necessary before you can interpret data. You need to know what question you're asking. You need to know what variables are plotted and or where. Is it a bivariate plot? Are we only looking at one variable? Do we have two, you know, a variable on each axis with two axes and then a third as based on the color, right? What do those variables actually represent in the world? When I am looking at annual totals, of visits to national parks, what is that actually? Okay, that is number of people that went to each park within one year. And because we read the words, but that but we need to actually get a sense conceptually of like what is that representing for us to be able to use that visual representation in a graph to our advantage to get to that interpretation piece, to get to the what does this mean to the broader context, to the phenomenon, the system, the world, whatever it is that I'm that I'm looking at. Um, how to read the axes and like what is, you know, not only just what is plotted where, but like do they increase as they go up or to the right, or do they decrease, or what do the colors represent, things like that. And then what is actually the pattern on the page? What are the data showing me on the page? Not what does it mean, but what did the data show me? And if you want to dive into more of that, like the difference between like what is the pattern and how do we interpret the pattern, I encourage you to check out the data bite of Describe Visual Patterns. Or again, we've got a whole data literacy series session on talking about patterns and identifying patterns. So I encourage you, now that we've had this sort of quick run through of interpreting patterns and context, pause the video and think about Okay, so what are strategies or processes that you can use with your learners to interpret patterns differently based on this, based on the thinking of like what it is we need going into it and how can that interpretation vary depending on what our question is and what our skill level is of our students working with data skills? And then are there any additional supports that might help you or your learners to better interpret the patterns in the data? What else do you need? What are what are what are your learners need to be more successful as we are asking them to interpret patterns and data? This is critical. This is the whole reason we look at data is to figure out like what is the story? What can I take away from those data? So I thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please feel to reach out, feel free to reach out. If you're looking for more resources, check out the video. Um, check out the website or other videos that we have. This is my electricity bill um, back from May 2019. And it was because I could see the pattern and interpret it to realize that, okay, so I could see the pattern that May 2019 was really different than May 2018 in terms of our kilowatt hours. Um, even though the temperature was pretty similar in May 2019 and May 2018, and I could interpret that to mean something was off and that did not mean that I should pay a lot more money. So this is for all of us to think through of like, how do we figure out the story from the data? How do we get a sense of what is going on? Thank you for joining me. Have fun playing with your data. Reach out with any questions and I'll see you again later. Bye.